Okay, hello and welcome to Chaotic Risk TV. This is Jay. I'm Jason J. Rock Houston. I'm speaking with my good friend Keith St. John. Uh, many people know Keith these days as the lead singer for Kingdom Come, and for many years he was also um, the, the lead singer for Montrose. And we're going to talk about all of that now. Keith, um, just just this week you took part in the All Star Jam at the um, Metal Hall of Fame. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Correct. Actually, here it is. Look at this right here. Bam. Wow. Wow. So we've got the um, we've got the the big guests of honor that were planned did their band reunion, which uh, was surprising because they were never supposed to play together. Like, and if you know these guys, never meant never ever ever. So I, mean, I guess if you're getting an honor, maybe you can make an exception. Yeah. 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 So we're talking about Twisted Sister. So that was a that was a real fun fun night for me because. I saw Twisted back when I was, you know, a very young lad. Um, I think they came around with Dokken. And be like 84, I, 85, if I remember correctly, around that time, yeah. I, it, ha it had to be a little later than that because for me to have been there, but um, not too much later. Yeah. And uh, which was cool because Twisted Sister was like the Long Island legend band oh, yeah. that was in the clubs for like you know apparently hundreds of years playing gigs and pounding the pavement before hey, they actually got a deal they put out about twisted in the club days i didn't but i would love to see it now that i've met jj and d and and talk to them and and all their cronies and stuff i really need to go back and check that out because yeah, you can still get that if you really want to like purchase it on amazon i'm sure i'm gonna find it and if i don't find it i'm gonna call up jj and i'm gonna get one from him because um it was a really great night and seeing them was great like i said when i was in my first bands coming out in the clubs on long island where i grew up the other guys who were already a little older would say oh you know this is what we have to do this is how twisted sister did it you know this yeah. and you get that you know like we're in the business of you know making it you know and stuff so there was twisted or there was zebra who was another long island sensation and both of them were signed. doing gigs you know randy jackson absolutely yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I I think there was a time period when they were kind of more semi-retired or retired, and then they kind of came back. And I knew when they came back because I, you know, had segued from living on the East Coast to the West Coast many, many years ago. I don't want to say how many. And yeah. all of a sudden, Zebra was going to be playing the whiskey. And I'm like, holy shit, Zebra from Long Island? So, yeah. Um, but now I'm good friends with Randy Jackson and, and the rest of the band stuff. And real and, quick, um, if, you know, um, if anybody knows any, if you know anything about Twisted Sisters history, like when the band kind of broke up in '87, it was kind of like you know they're on a downward slide. But but what I'm happy the Twisted fan when they decided to reunite and come back, they came back bigger and more popular than ever. Yeah, yeah, and I gotta say this other night, um, I have never seen a front man even seeing footage of d in his early days i have never seen a front man this aggressive and this entertaining and this connected to the audience i was like d is better than dick clark and ed sullivan and bob hope and all those guys put together and david lee roth yeah he doesn't even need to play the song doesn't He's even need to sing the song he can just girl, talk. when i seen him get up in front of a, those senate hearings back in 85 yeah. and they thought they had this long haired freaky, um, you know, rock guy and, and who knew nothing. And, and he uh, shocked the hell out of him that he was actually an educated dude, you know? <laughs> really? And, you know, and he really had a lot of very yeah. connected, intelligent things to say. And by the way, since it was their uh, induction into the metal hall of fame, um, they all spoke and JJ talked too. And JJ talked for a good half an hour, and he could have talked all night. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's another, he has that gift of gab as well. Uh, even backstage, he told me some amazing stories that were. Um, well, he, he's about the one that's managed his sister all these years, you know, and, and run all the business for them. Yeah. No kidding. No yeah, kidding. Yeah. Well, yeah, two focused guys. I mean, laser focused. I, I was like, that is the reason that band made it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, sure. absolutely. I mean, JJ especially because people fail to realize that there was a twisted sister before D. Snyder was in the band. Yes, there was, and they, and they talked about it yeah. on stage that night and mentioned it. Uh, and 
JJ said they did about 7,500 gigs as that band before wow. they before they were signed, before they got a record yeah. deal. And what did you think of uh, Mike uh, Mike Portnoy playing? Uh, Perfect. Like great... Yeah. Perfect. Um, you know, I I was an acquaintance of AJ's, and and I I loved him as a human being, and uh, it's still you know it's still do, super right? tragic, yeah. and sorry that he's gone. And I'm buddies with Mark Mendoza, and um, I never really knew D and and JJ because they always kind of kept themselves you know out of the sort of mix yeah, yeah. of the riffraff yeah. of us other musicians yeah, and, yeah. you know now that i got to meet them um you know it's all different but portnoy um it couldn't have been a more perfect guy i yeah. had no idea I, th I said to myself what's this gonna sound like but d yeah. said he, that that mike last... played a whole bunch of their last shows their yeah, last yeah, tours yeah. yeah so he's a perfect guy um absolutely you know, you've been involved at all in the metal hall of fame um previous years or you know how did you get invited to take part in all this i was asked to come and play a song sing a song in uh or two in 2020 which was the last one at the nam convention in yeah. anaheim in yeah. january 2020 and at that time neil pert just passed away i, I think it, it was either the morning of or the day before yeah the metal hall of fame awards wow. so um pat wound up calling up a bunch of people and by and large the last people that were added into the show and said hey man we gotta we're doing a special neil Peart uh uh, uh presentation tribute. and yeah. tribute with all these guys coming in and pat's a drummer and the guy who owns metal hall of fame and he's really passionate about drums so you know i i was like just a yeah. newcomer so i was like yeah no problem man i'll you know I can, you can have some rush tunes, huh? No yeah. yeah. So yeah, they did. They did a great. I I, I went and watched it. Um, met a lot of cool people that night um, who I hadn't known before, um, and uh, and I met Pat, who runs Metal Hall of Fame, and yeah. you know, and now we got to know each other more, a little bit I more think intimately. The Metal Hall of Fame is something really fantastic. I mean, the, the Grammys and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think it, you know, take take some lessons. <laughs> they got it. They got to write the Metal Hall of Fame. I think. Yeah. yeah, no, he's doing a great job. And, and what I love about him and, and the other guys that came with me and my posse is that the proceeds that he makes are going to his charity, DAD, which um, reaches out to uh, disabled children and disabled vets. That. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I always and, love uh, music. Hand for Pat. When music, you know, um, you know, helps out, you know, um, a less fortunate, you know, a needy cause, that, that's always good to, a way of um, bringing people and music together, you know um yeah that's absolutely, obvious man. what songs did you get to perform the other night uh okay. let's see what did we do well we did uh, i don't know okay open yeah. with that because it's a great opener yeah. um we used to open with that song in our band gunzo okay. gunzo was myself and rudy sarzo and i Tracy remember hearing Gunn. that okay yeah yeah okay and we used to open with i don't know and it was always a great opener man it has such happy you know amazing energy to open the night so we opened the night with that i miss doing it i haven't done it since i played it with rudy oh wow um and doug amongst other guitar players that he loves you know he was always a big randy rhodes fan so i mean he just burns his ass off on that song yeah 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 so he kills that randy stuff and uh okay so then we just thought it logical since i had doug and rudy on stage to do a white snake song and sure. do a dio song yeah so we did one you know one of those each uh and then there wasn't a lot of time i think we played more songs than any other act wow. and then yeah, um, you guys are all stars yeah so <laughs> i gotta say so, I, love, I love doug with the dead, dead days and i love what they're doing and glenn hughes <laughs> absolutely man i was always a fan of glenn you know yeah. um growing up and and hearing the uh being referred to the rootsier singers you know yeah. by the by the older singers in the industry and and somebody said you got to go listen to glenn hughes and get it together i mean um, I, I love i love what him and coverdale did on you know burn and, and all those great deeper folk tunes they did i mean um maybe and, uh, i discovered coverdale first and white snake and then i didn't realize the guy singing on that burnout that's covered in <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, when they did all that, uh, you, you should keep on moving. Angels yeah, yeah. dare to tread. All that stuff. I mean, that's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> insane, man. Love that stuff. Uh, yeah, stay down. Yeah, I love I love the two voices together. Those guys together. I tell you. 
it was a unique thing, you know, that will never happen again, for sure. Yeah. Now let, um, yeah. let me ask you, but the other thing you're, you've been involved with the last several years is Kingdom Come. And um, oh, yeah. And I know you guys have um, a couple of gigs coming up this week, one at the Whiskey and one in uh, Las Vegas. Now, um, the last time I talked to you, you had just joined up with the band and and you were guys, or, there's some legal issues you've seen if you could record any new music. Um, or, has that been worked through or are there any plans for new music or what's I up yeah, we do have plans for new music. Uh, my issue with doing new music right now is that James Kotek is on hiatus from the band yeah, um, yeah. for health issues. And so I'm I not see. really too sure which way this is going to turn. Yeah. It's, we're giving it time. Yeah. Los Elias from Slaughter, who's a great friend of mine, and he's also in Burning Rain. And he also does Raiding the Rock Vault with me in Las Vegas. Okay. He stepped in. Um in kingdom come and i'm so glad he's doing it because our schedules on everything else are going to concur you know so I mean, it kind of works such a perfect way. fit you know i mean blaz makes a lot of sense um i know Absolutely. he went back to slaughter and he's doing that and i'm glad to hear that but um yeah he's all one of my always one of my favorite drummers and i was so glad when i heard that he kind of came out of retirement and got back with slaughter you know yeah yeah um yeah see blas well we slowed the schedule down on raiding the rock vault in vegas now i was going to say i see him just about every day but now we've slowed the schedule down so i only see him about three or four days a week uh but you know still we stay in touch and he's playing on my solo stuff uh the keith st john solo stuff which you know my opinion is probably going to be the strongest stuff you're ever going to see out of me so, so there will be a cd in conjunction with um solo material with mine there will be yeah and, and do you have a projected date for that, like this year? Um, I keep saying one, and I keep putting my foot in my mouth. So I'm, I'm, what I'm going to say now is uh, hopefully by the summer we'll get this out. Well, you know, it's been this long. Fans have waited this long. You, you want to get it right. So, you know. Things keep coming up. I don't know why. I'm I'm just, I'm such a hippie, man. You know, put me in a pinball machine and just bat me around. And I'm like, yeah, I'll take that gig. Yeah, I'll take that gig. That's a good but, prop uh, to have, though, Keith. I mean. I am at, tell me, um, you know, when COVID and all the lockdowns, um, did, did that slow you down any or were you still finding projects? That was a godsend for me, actually. Uh, I hate to say that world yeah, but, I, I um, mean, yeah. because it got me off all the tours and all the all that kind of stuff. My strength and where I shine is in the studio. I yeah. mean, that's that's where I'm happy. I You can just lock me in a studio all day and keep sending me song ideas and I'll keep you know, I'll keep writing and uh, and or writing my own stuff and, and yeah. just keep on going. And, you know, I, I know I shoot myself in the foot a little bit because, you know, whenever I release stuff of my own or co-write with people and put it out, it always does great things. So uh, you're one you know, of those guys that you can have your, um, you know, hand in many different um, things and be successful. And that's that's never a bad thing. But, you know, in, in doing the solo thing, um, you find it a little more freeing where like you're not like if you're doing a burning rain cd you know there's a certain um you know, there's a certain thought or a certain box of what that should sound like versus doing solo music where you can kind of it can be whatever you want yeah well I, and not only that but um to be a decent chap you know yeah. um you've yeah. got to pretty much there's there's boundaries and lines where you know other people's ideas and thoughts have to you know come to a certain level as well you know, um, if you put me in a studio and put me in charge, you know, yeah, as yeah. a producer, which sometimes I do, um, I'm going to go in there and whip it out, you know, the way I see it, because, you know, I just, I have that kind of mind, you know, I, yeah. I get pretty laser focused on stuff. But, you know, sure. when you're working with other people, it's, it's a push back and forth until you find a happy medium. And sometimes... Sometimes with some guys I write with, it actually is like a, a just a downright on the table trade off. It's like, OK, I'll let you do the bridge the way you want to do it. If we can yeah. elongate the solo the way I hear it. And it's yeah. like, OK, I mean, we'll trade. Yeah. yeah, all the years of following, I can tell people um, anytime you've been involved with the project, I know it's going to be top notch. I mean, you got because of the level of players that are involved and then um, the musicianship for writing um, your talent as a singer and a, a writer now. Um, of course, as we mentioned, that people knew you for years playing with um, Montrose. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing we were talking about last time, you know, um, Ronnie had just sadly passed away. And um, you said that there 
was possibly maybe some stuff being released. Have you, uh, if his wife talked to you any more about that or? There is, and I need to call her. I've, uh -huh. I've literally been so busy the last four or five yeah, yeah. years, um, even during COVID. So, you know, what happened during COVID was I was able to say yes and finally take on a bunch of these other writing projects, co-writing yeah. with people around the world. And I was just stacked up with, with project, work, project, yeah. writing with people. And it was, and it was fun and it was great. And it was also made me some money. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do need to get back uh, in touch with Lisa Montrose and come up with a plan i could come up with my own plan and then just kind of tell her about it but i would rather have her involved that, yeah i would rather that i kind of bring her into the fold right from the get-go and um start out with an agreement on it and so that and we can sort of promote it together i mean i know that the last matros album they put out was kind of amazing because a lot of it had been recorded before ronnie passed obviously but then a lot of the musicians came together to finish it up and it was just amazing what an amazing album that turned out to be yeah that was some that was some cool stuff and um i'm gonna have to say it because it came up yeah some of that stuff will be some of the stuff that ronnie and i actually wrote together which oh. wasn't supposed to be used for that record yeah. but was and um well i i in the moment yeah. I feel like I graciously said, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm going to allow this, yeah. you know, even though, you know, I have copyright on this stuff. I'm well, you allow know, part, you part of that, I mean, this. very gracious, as you say, I mean, and, and I'm sure part of it was um, you're wanting to do what you could to kind of um, remember Ronnie, pay tribute to him. Absolutely. And then absolutely, I think by, you know, doing that and putting out your own version of these songs, People get a different, you know, two two different versions. I'm sure it'd be very different. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the, by and large, the West Coast fans, which are a big mob of fans yeah. um, from the Bay Area and and really all of California and and even up, you know, yeah, yeah, Portland and, and Seattle and all that stuff, they saw us play those songs live. Yeah, our way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many times, you know, at least four or five of those cuts. So they know that it's still out there and waiting to come around. You're the original um, source for it, you know. And, and talking about Matros, you know, I got this like a year or so ago and they re-released at least the first two albums, you know. Can you believe this is turning 50 years old this year? 50, yeah. What is it, 73? Yeah, Came out 73. 73, right? Yeah, and, and, and well, you, you know, of course you didn't play on the debut album, um, you know, I don't know if you were even around then or just a little bit, but <laughs> any of it, I got to ask the guy, what was it like um, getting the opportunity, though, to perform those songs live, that, that these songs that 50 years later still mean so much to people? Well, they did mean a lot to people, and um, it, it was one of the greatest times uh, for me because it was all very, um, very, very much a surprise and a really yeah. nice surprise in a very grand way that was happening in my life because ronnie was a guy i knew when i was writing songs with and some people were whispering in my ear you know you know ronnie's this and ronnie's that right and then yeah. um but ronnie had kind of faded away from music wanting to have anything really to do with the early mantras you know he was in a place in his life where he was yeah. you know he, he wouldn't play rock candy at any gigs when he went out and all that stuff and um we got together just to start writing new songs together because my buddy said, you got to check out this badass guitar player. I know he's looking oh, for wow. a singer to write some new stuff with. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we were doing. I mean, we wrote, you know, 15 or 20 tunes together and we were chugging along. And one day he said to me, Hey Keith, uh, you know, I got an offer from, from my friend uh, that I've known a long time and he's, he manages Steve Miller and he was asking me about getting my old band back together and if if i could put a lineup together and maybe do an album and a tour blah 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 he'd set up a tour yeah. and he's really connected and would set us up with great gigs etc cetera, etc cetera. would you be interested in checking it out i was like and everything was for me was always yes i was just a total hippie you know still yeah, wearing yeah. my bell bottoms and my turquoise jewelry and wow. stuff and i was like yeah of course man throw it by me so you know he threw me a tape one day and he said, can you get some guys together? We can go in the studio and, and, uh, and just 
you know, music, yeah. sure this out, play some music, see how it is. And uh, it was one of those things in the studio where I'm not sure what song we did. Maybe it was Rock the Nation. Yeah. And I had, you know, three or four songs ready to do. And, you know, but before the song was over, we did maybe a verse and a chorus and a half of a verse. And we just, you know, Ryan just stopped us and he said, what's cool, Keith, man? You want to think you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, yeah, sounds cool, man. Whatever. Let me know. And we didn't wind up using those guys in the studio in the band who came down. Um, but he asked me again. He said, hey, man, you're an L.A. guy. He goes, I'm out of the scene. Do you, maybe yeah. you got some guys who can handle this stuff and play it. Yeah. And so yeah, that, that was, was kind of catching on to what it is, you know, like, okay, this is, this is Montrose and blah, blah, blah. And Sammy Hagar was a singer. And yeah. so it just happened. It just by, by weird luck yeah. is, is the way I, is the way I sing. Yeah. And the way I do my thing, my Keith isms yeah. were very close to, sam's thing like where yeah. my voice breaks up yeah and the timbre of it in certain areas just happened to be very hagar ish yeah you know without yeah, yeah, really yeah. trying to be that it just was kind of that way for me yeah so, you know interesting, keith is i think you're the one guy that maybe ronnie worked with the longest i mean he worked with um many musicians um throughout his career he I, I heard sammy talk over here is that you know as, as great as ronnie was that you know he, he was kind of a moody guy but um and, and like part of the reason him and Sammy broke up from what Sammy has said is um, that Ronnie, which it kind of makes sense because the band was called Montrose. He, he didn't think anybody in the band should be more popular than him, or that's the way Sammy tells it anyway. So my, my question is, um, what do you think it was about between you and Ronnie that you guys had that chemistry where maybe you were a singer, but he worked with the longest um, that you guys just seemed to have that chemistry. I mean, as far as just being the longest to work with them. Well, one of it, and it's interesting you bring this up because I talked to Sam and I also talked to Bob James about that stuff about Ronnie. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, he got older. He, you know, this was so much later. I mean, that was 73 and we're talking about, I met him in 98 or 99 or something like that. And, you know, how many years later is it? 25 years later. And he, people change. Yeah. He's a thinker, you know, and he's, um, you know, he was also uh, into, um, you know, always like bringing himself to a higher level, you know, yeah. and he was kind of spiritual. Yeah. And I got to say, he still had a lot of those issues lingering inside of him, but consciously on the thinking side of the brain, he knew about it and he wanted to make that better. Yeah. You know, he made an effort right away to talk to me about the band and the focal point, you know, yeah. and saying, Hey, I see the band, the front line of the band is a triangle, you know, and it's like this and the singer is here at the apex and everything, yeah. everything focuses into the singer. Whereas, you know, when Bob James was with him right after Sam, yeah. he was still saying, you know, yeah. he'd, he'd draw a picture of three guys and the fourth one would be a really big giant guy and, and he'd say, see yeah. this giant guy, that's me. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of a thing. That was sort of the attitude that he had back then. And uh, and I think he just grew up more and uh, and it was lucky for me. And, um, you know, he, he also kind of liked to be a little bit of a, a father advice giving kind of figure to all the other musicians that played yeah, with him. Like the difference too, the difference in age. I mean, you know, he was a lot closer, same age as Sammy and, you know, maybe Bob James and he was to you. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe it was more of a respect or appreciation. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could have been, but um, you know, we we uh, he let me do a lot of what I wanted to do, and but whenever he made the calls yeah. of, of of the way he saw it, you know, I just like, yeah, fine, and, and, everything's and I'm good. I'm sure so. you're aware of this because uh, even just the way you talk about Ronnie, um, every time I've ever talked, um, that you're probably aware of it, um you're able to do a lot of what you do because of your association with Ronnie. I mean, I mean, you're very talented, but, and you would have probably been successful in your own right, but it might take a little longer. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I know what you're, what you're going for there. Um, yeah. yeah. I'd have to say that at least with the, especially with the Bay area clan, yeah. which a lot of people don't realize there's a bigger music scene from the Bay area than there was from LA. Yeah. There's, there's a bigger, you know, you know, the Journey guys, the Santana guys, 
the airplane yeah, you go back to the 60s yeah you know, all the hippie stuff you know the great yeah, all of these dudes man the dead Eddie Money. Money. yeah uh, and then Sammy, and then you get into Ronnie. the 80s and they have a big thrash scene <laughs> yeah sammy ronnie neil sean metallica yeah. uh tesla i mean there's so much talent For out sure. of the bay area you know and yeah. uh yeah my point is is uh I just all of a sudden, you know, kind of landed and not have to did not have to knock on the front door and wait for someone yeah. to let me in because I was already in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I was with Ronnie for a little bit of time. Found your place. Yeah, I was already kind of I was in the circle, in the inner circle. So um, I think that's what you're referring oh, yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in other words, I think you appreciate what Ronnie did for you. and You realize that. Yeah. You know. Um, that, that is yeah. like, people want to be checking me out, maybe, you know, well, it absolutely. Would take me a little longer. and, and um, I got to tell people before you wrap up the interview, Keith, um, as far as, you know, um, going out, you know, you do a great job of doing what you can to um, keep Ronnie's um, legacy alive. I mean, I remember for several years you were doing the Ronnie, um, remember Ronnie Montrose, a uh, tribute concert. And, and I love that because like you were saying earlier, when people think of Montrose, they think of those first two albums with Sammy. Oh, and, yeah. But I'm kind of guilty myself, like a lot of people, until you start putting on those concerts, I didn't realize all the other stuff that came after. And I thought, you know, oh, yeah. cool about the event. I said, you know, he's he's making people aware, not just to, um, you know, his, his era with Ronnie, but but everything that, that Ronnie did throughout his entire career. As, and they even put a DVD out. I remember I thought, oh, man, how cool is this? There's a lot more to... It's Ronnie Montrose cat than just those first two albums. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, and his history is amazing. You know, well, it's I mean, it's an American, it's American uh, birth of a rock star story. Man. And, and um, let me winter. grab one. Of, let me grab one of these sure. really quick because sure. it happens to be over here laying on the couch. I was thinking of possibly wearing it to the Hall of Fame the other day. And that's when I okay. dug it out. So people know what you're talking about. I don't yeah. know if we can see this thing. But oh, yeah, yeah, we can see, yeah, yeah. It's from Ronnie That's Montrose, it. remembered, and you can see some of the names on here. Yeah. Um, you know that come out, and that's not all of them, but that's typically one event. You know. Yeah, we're not even scratching the surface. I mean, that's just some of the guitar players. I mean, um, yeah. He had great yeah, drummer. As we can sit on the team shirt, events, you know. You so, play with Bob James. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I um. Well, what happened was. We used to play uh, one of the songs that Bob James did with Ronnie, and the one that they played on tour most was actually a cover. It was yeah. Nettie Cochran tune called 20 Flight Rock. I love that. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people dig the tune, so Ronnie would like to whip it out a lot back then. Yeah. And um, so I've sang it many times. Yeah. Um, but when I first finally found nobody knew what happened to bob james no one yeah, could yeah. find him uh but, yeah, Facebook page, yeah. <laughs> but there's a guy um a guy from rat juan crucier i don't know if you know juan bass player yeah yeah yeah, yeah. bass player from rat who was friends with bob james back then yeah. and knew where he was when i tried to track him down finally like it, it wasn't the first year i looked for him it was like yeah, one yeah. of the following years and I finally found bob james and once we got together and we, we hung out, he was the nicest, sweetest guy in the world. Uh, didn't really hang around the rock scene anymore. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, he loved his whole rock and roll past, rock and roll life. Well, another part of the story is after, after the Montrose days, Bob James put a band together with Frankie Benali and Rudy Sarzo. Oh, wow. wow. Okay, they put a band together called Private Army, wow. and, and they did a record. And so I got a hold of Frankie, and I got a hold of Rudy, and I said, hey, I got Bob James, because Frankie was already coming to the Ronnie Montrose Remember yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Rudy and I had done uh, a couple of bands together over the many years I was yeah. in L.A. So um, I was like why don't you come this year and do the Ronnie Montrose thing? I got Bob James. Why don't you guys do some private army songs? Oh, wow. That would be a gas, right? So, yeah. you know, I went to their rehearsals. I mean, we, we have rehearsals for these kind of events because yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. it's been a million years since most people have played these songs. So yeah, yeah. I went to the rehearsal and I sat in and it was wonderful watching, uh, 
watching Bob and Rudy and, and Frankie play their old stuff. Oh. And um, their guitar player uh, wasn't around anymore. I think maybe it was Pete Camita back in the day, but I had Mitch Perry come in and he he learned this stuff and he played with them. And, uh, and it sounded great. So, uh, and Bob and I were getting on great and he's a, he's a funny guy. He's like, He's very humorous. He'll send all these humorous texts all the time and send you these funny, funny little, yeah, yeah. You know, sexy anecdote, weird yeah. things. And anyway, um, we got to the show and he said, "Hey man, let's we want to do Twenty Flight Rock together." So we we put that in the show, and that's when I got to sing with him. You know, we traded oh, wow. verses back and forth doing Twenty Flight Rock, putting our foreheads together on stage, kind of a yeah. thing, and. Just making uh, making fun because that song Twenty Flight Rock" has a very old school. You feel like you're on an old, you know. It's one of my old, my all time favorite. You're on a Broadway stage or something. Song, you know? You know? And I say mantras because that's the version I first heard. So that's yeah, what I, you know, yeah, yeah, but, I, yeah. I, I never known that about Rudy and Frankie and Bob James playing a band. And, and I'm yeah. glad you brought that up because I'm gonna be doing an interview with Rudy in a few weeks. I'm gonna ask him about it's that. called private arm and you gotta bring it up. Just say we were talking and Keith yeah. told me, you know, yeah. Yeah. blah blah blah. That's that's cool. <laughs> and, and um and you know, talk about perfect timing because that, that gig you did with Bob James um died shortly after. I know. Well, yeah, he just I was at his house for it was a very small memorial at his son's house, uh up in up in Valley Village. And um and that's where I actually got to spend some quality time with Juan because I didn't really know Juan. I mean, I saw him I'm like, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. But we didn't really get to talk seriously until we were at Bob's uh, uh, memorial. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, by and large, maybe we'll try to do something together if there's time in everybody's busy lives. I know Juan's right not so busy. I mean, he's got a lot of downtime these days because rats not doing anything, but yeah i guess well steven is steven's doing the steven piercy thing and he seems to be pretty successful at that i think he's just kind of tired of all the feuding you know and okay i'll just do my own solo thing and play all the rap music that's what he lives in vegas now we've actually called him about coming to do the the rating the rock vault so maybe he will come and guest in at some point so you're you're living in vegas these days huh well i've got two places i'm in uh in laguna beach and here in henderson which is you know the suburbs of vegas uh and so, Keith, um, um, are you going to have any special like guest stars on the solo album? Are you going to um, have different players on different tracks? I, you know, I had that kind of thing lined up, yeah. and you know, some of the very special players that I played with over the many years yeah. uh, have sent me tracks, and I was going to do it that way. But I, I'm, I may do that as the next record after this one. But this it. one's just going to be my stuff, my way. Yeah with a guitar player that really works well with me. And, you know, I, yeah. you know, I produce the stuff the way I see it, you know, yeah. and it's, um, it's not, it's not the record I expected it would be, but I really love it. I mean, I love the way it sounds. I just didn't expect this particular style of material to fall out of me as, as much. And, as and, and if, if you love it, probably the fans are going to love it. Now, let me ask you um, before we wrap this up um, for tonight. Um, Talk a little bit about Kingdom Come. I mean, um, um, what's it been like for you to sing of those songs? Because, you know, a lot, a lot of people, um, you remember back in the day, Kingdom Come got a lot of um, a lot of slack for, you know, being a so-called Zeppelin ripoff band. Well, I don't really, in I their day, that. in yeah. that original lineup of Kingdom Come during yeah. the Monsters of Rock times, yeah. uh, it was. It was a bad thing yeah. to be accused of sounding like somebody else. Now it's a great thing. If you but come I mean, out... If you come out right now and you got some young guys that are 19 years old and they sound exactly like the Rolling Stones, everyone's going to go nuts for them yeah, and say yeah. this is the best thing since sliced bread. But back yeah. then, they got a whole bunch of negative press. For me, um, we were talking about um, when Kingdom Come broke up, um, you know, in the early 90s, um, they got a, bit, a lot of backlash because people were saying, you know, they're a Zeppelin clone band. And when the band came back and is now fronted by Keith St. John, they don't seem to get the same reaction. I was just kind of curious on your thoughts on that. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I, I think you're, you need to turn on your mic, Keith. Your, your mic, let's see here. Um, 
try this one. Oh, this there is you go. another mic button. Oh, okay. Okay. So there were two of them. Uh, coming back at you. I don't know if you can edit that or whatever you got to do. But um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, back in those days, uh, music was still following its path that wasn't there yet. Yeah. You know, like classical music went through, you know, feudalistic, you know, the Baroque, finally organized Baroque to classic to romantic period to 20th century. And rock and roll was still evolving at that point. You know, the end. Yeah. 88. They were, we were still in the sort of romantic period of, of rock and roll music. It hadn't hit the, the 20th century, which is break all the rules and, and, and break people's eardrums, too, with, you know, stuff People that doesn't sound great. still CDs and vinyl and cassettes, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so, and at that point, um, the generations were, that were going by, let me just say this, Led Zeppelin is probably, you know, the... They're the quintessential rock stars. They are the, the rock band of all time for all of humanity, for now and forever. Yeah. And the 80s was the only, it was not cool to play or to listen to Led Zeppelin when they were actually out. Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, who were obviously still alive and around, yeah. I mean, they just, they gave up their rock and roll image, started wearing parachute pants and getting mullets and stuff and just kind of yeah. like trying to drift around the times as kind of old guys back then. Yeah. I don't think anybody realized, um, except maybe me, no, just kidding, uh, yeah. that that was the footprint of rock and roll forever, for all of all yeah. of time, yeah, yeah. for humanity, from the late 60s into parts of the 80s. And... Um, since we were still in that swing and on that mountain and you know zeppelin kind of happened already i can understand why and, and your listeners can probably understand why yeah. at that point it wasn't cool just to come out and quote unquote lift some riffs out of those big iconic zeppelin tunes and yeah. kind of go okay well we're going to throw this into the 80s format with the uh the drum machine sounding you know heavy aggressive drums and all that stuff uh i thought what Kingdom Come did with that stuff was brilliant, beautiful, sounded great. Um, of course, I was always a big Zeppelin fan. I was a little late getting to the party, you know, so in the 80s, I was listening to Zeppelin and, you know, wearing bell bottoms and, you know, uh, hippie shirts and all that stuff yeah, when yeah, yeah. Every, everybody else was wearing all black, you know, and spandex and, and, and whatever the 80s, you know, and eye makeup and stuff. Yeah. I wasn't doing that, you know, I was yeah, yeah. kind of going that direction. So, I mean, even when that stuff came out, I loved it. Um, the lucky, just sort of coincidental thing for me, once again, is, you know, I was kind of in that whole Montrose, you know, obviously those guys were huge Zeppelin fans as well. Um, uh, Sammy, you know, he loved a lot of singers and one of them was obviously Robert Plant. And, you know, so, that was my whole niche already. So for me to step into Kingdom Come and sing that stuff was, once again, just an easy fit. You know, yeah, just kind of yeah. walk up and sing it, and it just kind of works out. You know. And you know, Keith, it, it's not uh, very like apparent to most people, but when I look at the parallels of um, Montrose and Kingdom Come, there are some similarities in that. Um, again, when people think of Montrose, they think of those two first Montrose albums. When they think of Kingdom Come, they think of those yeah. Two and they forget exactly about that. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Maybe I shouldn't say this because maybe think people think I'm OCD or something, but there were two songs on the second Montrose record that always went into the tour set, always, because they were really popular amongst Montrose fans who loved that first album. Mm -hmm. And there were two songs on the Kingdom Come second record that we oh. always put in the concert sets because. You know, I don't know how that worked out. They had exactly one album plus two songs that, yeah. that needed to get played in every show that they played. So um, that's, a, that's a funny tidbit. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was always in that sort of genre. And, and growing up in New York and when I first got out into those clubs, some of them being the same clubs that Zebra and, and, uh, and Twisted had played back in their day, um, it, it was the 80s, you know, it was the late 80s and everybody was listening to that. Yeah. But the band I put together came out and we were doing 
uh, we, we were doing a whole lot of love, and instead of the breakdown in the middle, we were doing, babe, I'm going to leave you. And the New York audiences were going absolutely apeshit for that. They love that, you know, the East Coast stuff. You know, WBAB was still playing four shots of Zeppelin or Aerosmith or, or Bad Company all day long on the radio, even during the 80s when, you know, everyone was listening to uh, Tainted Love and, yeah. and Kaja Gugu and all that stuff. So. Yeah, and of course, we know you got the gate in large part because of your friendship with James Kodak. But here's another interesting thing you're a very different type of singer than Lenny Wood. I mean, Lenny's a German singer from Germany, got an thick, thick accent. Absolutely. And so, what was it? How difficult was it for you to learn these songs? Or, you know, it's kind of interesting because I, I think once you join Kingdom Come, maybe enough time had passed between the band's last gig, you know, and coming back, and people would miss the band maybe, and they're okay, well, this is a version we're getting, we'll, we'll take it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's, hopefully it's not quite that bad, but um, no, what I, mean, I yeah, think, yeah. I think um, you know, Lenny's version of doing plant, Robert Plant-isms, yeah. and my version of that is obviously quite different, but, yeah. um, you know, he, his voice, He's a little bit more, he has a little bit sort of more Getty Lee in his voice. He has a little bit more of a cleaner yeah. high end than mine. And mine's a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit more of that plant thing where it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're floating on a rasp, you know, and, um, you know, with a lot of those long raspy reverbs and stuff. And um, I haven't heard anybody not digging it, you know, uh, as far as like that. At the shows and whatnot, it's it's been um, it's been pretty decent, and yeah. at least the people talking to me are like, "Oh, dude, you're like the perfect guy to do this right now." So, and maybe because I'm not as as straight up metal, you know, as a lot of the singers that are around now, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's almost two different eras of uh, Kingdom Come. Obviously, there's the original lineup, and then there's kind of what Lenny did for uh, many, many years with like different musicians coming in and out of the band. It, then, uh, over in Germany, but the thing is, is the American audiences don't know have no songs. idea that even exists. You know, it's like, they, 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 they couldn't name one of those songs and probably yeah. have never even run across it. And if you I had to search for it to find it, you know, yeah. and see, oh, what's Lenny been doing recently? You know, of course I do my research when I get into yeah. this stuff. And yeah. um, for me, um, it was fortunate in a way that Lenny didn't continue with that sound over the years. You know, he changed his whole approach and went in a completely different direction. So fans couldn't really say, well, here's Lenny over here still doing this very Zeppelin-esque, you know, big, you know, uh, blues rock thing meets the 80s that he was doing back in the end of the 80s because that's not what he was doing. And so I didn't have to get compared to that, which yeah. was cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, what he was doing was fantastic, but it was completely different. And I'm like, okay, well, that's so different. The fans that like that stuff really aren't going to be comparing to this guy. And, you and, know, so. Yeah. And I think, like you said, um, the time that he was kind of um, running Kingdom Come and, you know, at the helm and with his various uh, different band members, that was still very popular over in Europe, but they, they didn't really tour over here in the U.S. So, again, by the time this lineup gets together, enough time has passed, I think, the fans at around 88, 89. Well, yeah, oh, we forgot about this band. We forgot just how great they really were, you know? Well, that's just it. And the other thing that's happened over the last 20 years, and it was happening then already in, in the late 80s and in the 80s, but it was harder for fans to accept a new singer in a band back then. Yeah. But over the last 20 years, a lot of that has happened. A lot yeah. of bands it, have, you know, switched members. Yeah. And, and by and large, it's been the singer sometimes. And, you know, fans are a lot more receptive to that. You know, these days, you know, people come up to me and they say, man, I really love the, the kid that's singing in Skid Row right now. You got to hear him. It sounds great. He's great on stage, sings that stuff great. And it's it's a whole different perspective on it, you know. Yeah. Whereas, For example, is look at what, what Warren's doing. Would you ever thought that Warren could have carried on without Janie Lane? But I think those right. songs you wrote such great songs they're a the soundtrack to our lives yep we desire to see that you know and they want to hear them i mean and even the big the older iconic bands you got go out and see sticks and, and you know i'm naming like a roots rock americana that was like 
Americana of the 70s was that band, Sticks, And they do it without Dennis in the band. You never and the fans mean. don't complain. You know, the fans don't complain at all. I mean, the ultimate um, is Brian and Roger going out uh, um, with Queen and Adam Lambert. Who would have ever thought they've been able to do that? But again, I think the songs are mean more to people than who's playing them. I mean, the, he, Adam yeah. Lambert did a great job of doing Freddie, you know? And, and by and large, um, Brian, his sound and his guitar is very, very unique and identifiable as yeah, well. Yeah. You know, when you have something else that's really identifiable and a big part of the rock stardom, that makes it so much easier. I mean, for Van Halen, you got Eddie Van Halen and he's still in the band, you know, yeah. so any way you slice it, you know, if they come up with a decent product, which I guess one out of two times wasn't too bad, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Come up with a decent product, you know, they can come out there and still march on and do great as Van Halen. You know, it, it gets a little bit more questionable when, you know, your, your, guy, your guy that's not in it is the only superstar that has an yeah. identifiability in the band. Yeah, then it gets hard, like, right? When it gets to the point and you guys hopefully do get some new music out there, I think it'll give it even more validity that um, very much like Sammy Hager coming into Van Halen. Um, let's be honest, who, who thought that anybody could replace David Lee Roth? It's, you know, two different bands, but both bands were great. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and by and large, he didn't really replace Roth because he, what what they were doing was not Dave-esque in any way, shape oh, or yeah, form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and they worked it in the press as well. I mean, all those gags about, you know, oh, I hate Dave. He's the worst guy that's ever lived. And, well, well, I mean, that made that put the fans in that mindset. Like, okay, this has nothing to do with Dave, and not ever going to try to be like Dave. And 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 it and it worked. You know, yeah. it's really good stuff. Now, you uh, know. I know you've toured the last several years with Kingdom Come, but um, have you guys ever played over in Europe since you've been in the band? Yeah, yeah, we've been over there. Uh, the last gig I'd have to say was um, that show because okay. uh, it was at Sweden Rock and. By and large, um, so James was going. What happened to our screen here? I can see you. Are you there? You see me? Yeah, I, I'm here. I can't see you. I don't know what happened. Um, it's really interesting that uh, you know the last thing we did was Sweden Rock, because uh, I'll say again that was the show. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, um, so James, he was really he had broken some bones and he had some serious health issues that I can't get into, but he really, okay. really wanted to still play this show. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know what, why don't we, why don't we have someone else come and fill in for the show? And, and the other guys were, you know, kind of divided and, and James yeah. was like, nah, man, I really want to do this. So he came out and did the show and he, let me just say, I mean, he played in a lot of ways, he played great, but in other ways, I mean, he physically just didn't have the strength to keep yeah. up those aggressive tempos of those songs. Yeah, yeah. So some of the songs that weren't ballads, you know, kind of wound up being uh, a little slow in tempo. And yeah. the very journalist that made it his mission back in the late 80s, in 89, to slag Kingdom Come about the Zeppelin thing was the same journalist that was there that day at Sweden Rock and just went off and sent in this awful article into Blabbermouth and uh, and the other sites and just kind of really went off on the band and stuff. And um, uh, I kind of got away unscathed. He didn't say anything negative in any way about me, but he really just went off kind of on James and about the band going out and presenting it that way. So at that point, everybody kind of agreed and said, hey, James, you, you just need break. to take a break. You need yeah. to take a break for a while. And so that's how that came to be. Uh, like I said, I, I didn't think we should have played it that way just in case. And then, of course, just in case happened. And, uh, and we can't do anything about it now. But the well, best thing is... Chris, so let me ask you, if you had that to repeat over, like if something like that's come up, you'd probably just say, you know what? We're going to hit, hit the backstage. <laughs> Well, it it is what happened happened, and I uh, I'm a fire sign. I don't know if you know about astrology. So I'm a I'm an Aries okay. with a Leo rising and a Sag moon. So I'm all fire. So 
So basically, you throw me out of a plane without a parachute, and, and uh, I got no problem. I'll make it down. No there problem. Go, go. I don't so, need a plan. So you throw me on stage, and the tempo is slow, and I'll sing along with that, and I'll have a good time doing it. You know, so and like, um, the show the show's coming up this week. Kind of the band, kind of the Kingdom Comes comeback, right? I mean, since that show, you're gonna really. Uh, be able to make that guy eat his words and prove what the band. Well, we, you know, we we've done a couple of shows since then, and they've all been good. Um, but yeah, but we have more shows coming up, and the first ones are right here in the hometown. Uh, you know, just doing, just playing a couple of clubs. You know, basically yeah. to. Uh, we want to do it a because we love the local fans and our yeah. friends and stuff, and b because uh, we want to keep the band playing as much as possible until yeah, we go right, out on bigger stuff. The band's out there, Keith, because, you know, that's the other thing about since you joined Kingdom Come. I mean, I think it's cool that the band kind of, you know, went out the way it did originally, you know, and people kind of forgot about the band until they came back. And um, it's almost like you come back in a bigger way, if, if that's even um, possible. Well, you're, definitely. You're, definitely. You're, if, uh, if we tried to... Like, you know? I would try to do this in the 90s. It wouldn't have worked, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all, people would have been dead set against, you know, replacing Lenny Wolf. And, yeah. you know, second of all, it just people were people were once again moved on from that music at that yeah. point. Yeah. And, and they I weren't really that interested. Your time tonight, Keith, but I got to ask you before we do finally wrap it up for tonight. Um, have you ever met Lenny Wolf? And what was that experience like? No, no. I, I met his brother, Marco. Okay. Um, his brother Marco Wolf is a spitting in his image of Lenny. And uh, the funny thing was, is I didn't really know who he was or anything about him. Yeah. And we were on our first, very first ground tour, just breaking the band in on the road. Yeah. And it was up in Seattle. And Marco lives up near there. And we're on the show in the first song. And I see, I basically see Lenny Wolf in the audience, like right, standing right in front of me. And, uh, well, like I said, fire sign, I take everything in stride. I'm like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, Lenny's here, whatever, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I get done, and this guy comes up to me and gives me all these big hugs at the end of the show. He's like, man, I was, I was here to check this out for Lenny. He goes, he was half crying and half hugging, and he was like, you hit the notes beautifully, and, you know, did a great job, and That's good to hear. everything sounded amazing. I, I, I love you, man. And, uh, and, but that was Marco Wolf. I go, oh, you're not Lenny, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so you you kind of, inside, I didn't show it, but inside, you kind of freaked me out. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to meet him. Next yeah. time I'm over in Germany, I'll, I'll try to look him up and uh, and possibly yeah. run well, into him. Well, Keith so. H. this has been a memorable interview. I tell you, it's one of the best ones I've done so far. We we had a few technical difficulties, but it still came out fantastic. We did yeah. have a few. We did have, yeah. a, hey, can I throw in a few, a few uh, current plugs before we go? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I've got um, I've got an album that just came out. The album was re released about a month ago with the band called Desert Dragon, and um, there's already a, a single released. Uh, there's a video out called Lock and Load, yeah. uh, but we're currently working on a video, a more real video that's not just a lyric video with all kinds of crazy footage in it, uh, on a song called Swamp Thing. And Swamp Thing uh, is a tip of the hat to like uh, something between Mississippi Queen and maybe wow. the old man down the road by uh, by John Fogarty, and it's 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 really fun. And, and physical um, copies of that people can purchase? Not yet, not yet. They can purchase the album. They can purchase the album. They can go to www.desertdragon.com. Desertdragon.com, and they can purchase. Uh, let me see if I got it laying over here. This record. It's got shrink wrap on it. You probably can't see it, but uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a Desert Dragon record, and um, it's got some amazing, cool songs that are like um, they're not metal. It's not a metal band. It's a throwback to like the late '60s, early '70s kind of Kansas meets Zeppelin meets Free, and then occasionally meets like prog rock like elp or yes or something it's it's really musical and it's it's something i did just you know for my own head in a way and um with some local guys in la uh the second thing i'm working on uh is a is a solo artist out of holland his name is ron coolen and um we're kind of doing song by song and this is a more metal project for sure and we have a, a video release coming out in a month uh, with a song called Heavy Metal Till I'm Dead is the oh, name wow. of the track. And um, 
it's a really aggressive track, yeah. but it's got a very anthemic yeah. ACDC chorus and, and another video that I'm working on having some fun. Oh, Keith, you, you know, yeah. I'm going to have to have you back, and we're not going to wait as long since the last interview. I'm not going to wait another four okay. years. Okay. But um, thanks for doing this tonight, and I'll let you know when, the, when this all um, gets posted. But, you know, I'm going to have you back. So um, next time we'll talk about how the two Kingdom show, come shows went this week. But uh, take care, my friend. Yeah. Have a great night. Bye you bye. take it easy, Jay. Rock and roll. Thanks for keeping it going, brother. Anytime. You too. All right. See you.